Hi, I'm Reba Rausch, and I'm with the uh, University of Utah Press. I'm the acquisitions editor for the press. I'm here today with Hannah New. Uh, she's our sales and marketing manager, and we're hosting uh, a launch for a brand new book today. We're very excited about it. So we want to welcome all of you, wish you a happy Veterans Day, and thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to join us. Um, we will be doing uh, a format where we will have eight speakers. Uh, these are all authors from the book, and I will introduce those speakers. When they are talking, if you have any questions, uh, please, uh, just enter those questions in the chat at the bottom of your screen on Zoom. And we will, once the presentations are done, each author will talk about five minutes. Once uh, the presentations are over, we'll get to as many questions and answers as we can. Um, so with that, um, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, the book that we're launching today is With Grit and Determination. A Century of Change for Women in Great Basin and American Archaeology. And let me show it to you. This is the, the cover. There's the back of the book. It's a beautiful book. Um, and we're very excited about launching it today. Uh, this book, um, is just barely come out. So they will just start shipping it from uh, the Chicago Distribution Center soon. So if you've ordered it, it will be about two weeks till it uh, ships. Um, we will be recording this today for both the author's book page and for our YouTube channel. So if you would like to uh, re, re see this or let others know about it, it will be posted there once the event is over. Um, the first author we have up is Suzanne Eskenazi. She's an archaeologist and principal investigator at SWICA Environmental Consultants in Salt Lake City, and she's the lead uh, volume editor for the book. Uh, our next speaker will be Nicole Herzog, and she's an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Denver, Colorado, and she is the other uh, volume editor for the book. Uh, Heidi Roberts, has been a professional archaeologist since 1978 and is founder and owner of HRA Inc. Conservation Archaeology. Uh, Catherine Fowler is Foundation Professor Emerita, University of Nevada, Reno, where she taught cultural and linguistic anthropology and focused her research on Great Basin indigenous ethnobiology, landscapes, and material productions. Laurel Glidden is the forest archeology span for the Dixie National Forest. Uh, she lives in Southern Utah with her husband and two daughters. Shannon, Shannon Tishingham is an archeologist uh, who studies human environmental relationships by hunting, gathering, and fishing communities in Western North America. She is an assistant professor of anthropology and director of the Museum of Anthropology at Washington State University. Melinda Leach has been an archaeologist and professor working in the Southwest and the Great Basin for many years, pursuing interests in lithics, textiles, rock art, and gender and prehistory. And we'll congratulate, congratulate her. She just retired. Uh, so many happy roads ahead. Uh, Linda Scott Cummings chose to pursue analysis of archaeobotanic remains, both micro and macro, within a private business format to innovate, expand, and contribute to understanding the past climate and people's diet and lifestyles. And with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Susie. Thank you, Reba, for that great introduction. Um, I just wanted to start out by thanking everybody for taking an hour out of your day to join us in this very, very exciting uh, moment in time for us, uh, which really started about almost exactly four years ago, actually, at the Great Basin Anthropology Conference, um, when I was standing around in the book room, looking at all the women um, participating, everybody on the, in the program who was going to be presenting. There were so many women, and yet um, I felt as though I was actually standing in line waiting to get my book signed by Kay Fowler. 
when this occurred to me. And I went over to Nicole and I said, what is with this? There are so many women represented here doing the work, and yet I don't feel that they're being recognized um, for the journey that they've taken to come this far. And we decided then and there that at the next GBAC conference, um, we were going to host a symposium and ask, kind of cast a wide net and see uh, who would be interested in presenting not just on the work that they're doing, but on their personal journeys to be in the field of anthropology and archaeology. And the result was incredible. Um, it turned into one of, I think it was the most well attended symposiums at that conference in 2018. It was in Salt Lake. Uh, there was standing room only. And what we heard were some really powerful personal stories about um, from these women working, uh, the things they overcome, overcame uh, to get where they did. And also we heard uh, stories about publications and uh, representation uh, in publishing, which are also really, really enlightening as well. Uh, I wanted to show you, I have a photo of the original crew that presented um, at that conference. And you can see everybody here. Um, we did have a couple of people who presented at that conference that uh, decided not to contribute to the volume, which is great. Um, but uh, you can see this was, we were all super delighted to be finished and uh, it was just a fabulous, fabulous day. So um, I think that's, I just really wanted to say thank you again to everybody who's participated in this process. We could not have done it without um, Reba, our incredible acquisitions editor, all the formatters and proofreaders and all of the authors who just met their deadlines <laughs> over and over again. And it's been such such a delight working through this entire process. So with that, I'll turn it over to Nicole. Yes, again, um, just thanks so much to all of you for taking the time uh, to join us today. I, I can't express how thrilled we are um, to be launching this book and um, what incredible company we find ourselves in. We're so fortunate um, that this process has been so smooth and so wonderful. And I think I speak for both Susie and myself that we feel very humbled um, that all of these authors chose to uh, go on this journey with us. So um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the process of putting the book together and um, Susie and I working through uh, how we organized the book um, and thinking about these sort of themes that came up. So, you know, as we read the pieces that came in, it was pretty clear that there were three really important themes that were sort of woven through each of the chapters. Um, and so the first of those themes was one about serendipity. And so almost all of the authors talked about these opportunities um, that really opened the door uh, for them to the world of archaeology. And often these opportunities came by chance. And um, sometimes it was gods themselves, at least in the terms of academic gods, who stepped into these lives of um, the, our authors and really changed the way that they uh, viewed um, doing archaeology and being an archaeologist. And so these kind of relationships became the intellectual fodder for the budding careers of many of the participants in our symposium. And um, these relationships then kind of constituted what was the second major theme that we saw in all the papers, which was one about mentorship. And it turned out that it didn't matter whether the mentors were men or women, but the guidance and support that these mentors provided each of our authors um, were just foundational. Uh, and so there were several names that came up again and again, and I saw so that KK actually is just also publishing a book about one of these mentors that came up over and over again, um, the Dutton's Dirty Diggers. And so um, a couple of people whose intellectual influence was really broad and whose ideas obviously shaped the paths of many people around them. And then it was also this sort of ebb and flow of intellectual influence that constituted the third sort of main theme that we saw, 
which was that um, our own theoretical ideas and perspectives and those of our mentors really um, give us a lens through which to view the world. And it is unique and special to have women mentors to help us see the world in a different way. And so, so many people touched on that in their chapters. Um, and each of them sort of discusses like this influence that led them not only to their own self-discovery, but sometimes took them down paths that were really different from their original training. And so as we reflected on these three themes, it was pretty obvious that these themes were not isolated to Great Basin women scholars. And that's when we saw that um, actually these are themes that are important to women archeologists um, in American anthropology and archeology span in general. And so we realized that this book is meaningful beyond just um, the scope of Great Basin authors and Great Basin research. Um, and so then there were several papers in the volume that sort of explicitly talked about and examined um, this idea of uh, publishing in our field and they sort of highlighted whose stories were told and whose were not. And so Susie and I decided to sort of to contextualize the stories in the book. It was important to explore the history of women's contributions in the discipline. And of course, lots of people have done this uh, already. And so this was a nice way for us to sort of summarize a, a sort of um, larger field of work. Um, and so we wanted to talk um, about not only uh, the setbacks that um, women had experienced, but the gains too. And so we felt that um, by exploring those women's roles in the archaeological process, we could kind of set the stage for the more personal stories that were coming up in the book. Um, women have faced an uphill battle, as many of us know, um, trying to gain a foothold in what has traditionally been a male-dominated field. Um, we discussed the ways that women were um, given lesser roles in archaeological work. Um, discriminated against and some of the stories in the book talk about um, harassment and um, the deeply personal way in which those relationships shape the way that you can do your work and be a professional in our field. Um, <clears throat> but I think what really shines in this volume is that um, the work of all of the women here and all of the pioneering women that are doing work in archaeology um, demonstrates that we've got grit, we've got determination, um, we're excited about the future ahead. And so really the chapters in this book are just an inspiration. Um, it's just been such an honor to work with everyone and we're so humbled to be here with you. So I'm going to pass it on now to Heidi so that we can hear from more of the co-authors about their stories. Thank you so much, Nicole, and thank you, Susie. Thank you both for organizing the session at the Great Basin Conference and inviting me. At first, I was hesitant because traveling that journey through those days and thinking about the past is difficult. I'd also like to thank um, the press, Reba and the University of Utah Press, and again, Susie and Nicole for pushing this through so rapidly. Um, my chapter, I wanted everybody to understand that it's a personal journey and I wanted everybody to have a context to understand what it was like in the 1970s to try to become an archeologist in the Great Basin, a woman archeologist in the Great Basin. And what I found when I reflected on what had happened to me is that discrimination is difficult because nobody ever tells you, you're not, we're not accepting you to graduate school because you're a woman. We're not going to hire you because you're a woman. Look at RGB, RBG. When she um, graduated with her husband from law school and they both set out to look for uh, uh, positions in New York, he was offered them right away. And she went to tons and tons of uh, interviews and um, looked hard for a job and couldn't get one. And I doubt anybody told her right to her face, we don't want to hire you because you're a woman. It's, it's, um, it's something that I didn't even realize until I had an opportunity to spend uh, some time with Kay and Don Fowler and uh, realized that my feelings that I had been discriminated against were real. Anyway, um, this paper not only describes my experiences, my personal journey, but it honors the female mentors who uh, 
opened the doors for me. Sheila Brooks at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas was the first one. Margaret Linus, um, an archeologist, she was one of the first archeologists in the Great Basin to kind of break the glass ceiling. And um, she was a huge supporter in, in the graduate school department when I went there. She also was a, a mentor and uh, worked for HRA at times and she became a very close friend. Um, so that's pretty much the focus of my paper is to follow through my journey. A lot of it was written up in my, fictionalized in my novel that the University of Utah published. My, my alter ego, Ivy Jones, uh, talked about it without pointing fingers or, or giving names. But um, I'd like to, once again, thank everybody. And uh, Kay was, played a huge role in my career. Um, she's the next speaker. I also like to thank many of the men. Uh, I'm one of the women in this session who, who was helped by men along the way, uh, Tom Mueller, Rick Allstrom, Kenny Wench, my husband, my son. Uh, uh, it's, it's a good opportunity to thank not just the women, but the men. So with that said, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Kay. Go Kay. Heidi's a tough act to follow, but I guess I don't have any choice. <laughs> my chapter is somewhat a retrospective as I'm looking at the background struggles of another uh, well-known Great Basin ethnographer, Isabel Kelly, uh, as well as my own story. Kelly always wanted to be an archaeologist, uh, as did I, at least initially. Kelly attended the University of California, Berkeley. Um, in the late 1920s, she graduated in 1932. And there wasn't an archaeologist on the anthro staff in Berkeley at that time, so there was no way that she could get archaeological experience. So she did the next best thing. She went over to geography and learned about landscapes and how to view landscapes from Carl Sauer. Uh, she also signed up for A.V. Kidder's um, Museum of New Mexico field school in New Mexico. Uh, she and three women. Uh, were put as a separate crew working on a, on a site called Tecalote Ruin outside of Las Vegas, New Mexico, where they did a phenomenal job. And even Kidder had to uh, say that they did a tidy little excavation. Uh, we thought maybe they were awarding them the good housekeeping seal of approval in that uh, little comment. But nonetheless, she got a taste of it. When she finished her PhD, there were no jobs because that was the depth of the depression. And uh, so she, she especially didn't get a job because she was a woman. And it was of course assumed that only men had families to support and that women could be independent somehow or sink or swim on their own. Um, she survived on grants for several years for ethnographic work with the help of Sauer and A.L. Krober at Berkeley, and also with Kidder. And uh, after she, she did, on those grants, she did quite extensive field studies, including among the Northern and Southern Paiute and the Coast Miwok. Um, she ultimately, uh, she, well, while she was doing Southern Paiute field work and all the other field work, she continued to correspond with her mentors always always saying but remember my first love is archaeology and so she would note all the archaeological sites that she was seeing along the way including in southern utah um, ultimately with no real prospects for a permanent job uh, she uh, went to mexico where she um, pursued in her career in both archaeology and ethnography as an independent scholar, and it was a very successful one. She was considered, she still is considered the mother of West Mexican archaeology. Now, I followed in Kelly's footsteps 35 years later, um, after having been introduced to archaeology, as Heidi said, through the Girl Scouts in the Southwest, uh, mobile camps that were held by Bertha Dutton. 
And uh, when I entered the University of Utah in 1962, the Glen Canyon Project was in full swing, archeological salvage in the Glen Canyon area. And there were no opportunities for women to get field training because the country was considered too dangerous for women to be out there. Uh, but Professor Jess Jennings hired me to do ethnoarchaeology with Southern Paiute guides. And it was there that I picked up Kelly's trail. Uh, Don Fowler, who did lots of archaeology in Glen Canyon, and I were then married. We both moved to Pittsburgh to finish our degrees. When Don finished, uh, we came to Nevada, and I continued to follow Kelly and did ethnography with Northern Paiute, Southern Paiute, and ultimately the Timbisha Shoshone. My plight at UNR was not unlike the uh, career paths of a number of women, including who are represented in the volume, in that I was a spousal hire. So at that point, sans PhD, I got a half-time position in the anthro department. And uh, when I finally finished my PhD and I was able to get a full-time position, then uh, I battled for at least another 20 years to get equal pay along with the other few women who were on the campus at that time. Uh, so that's basically my story. Uh, and I sort of go back and forth between what I was up to and also uh, how I was following Kelly. But I too, as Nicole mentioned, uh, needed to thank my male mentors as well, including Jess Jennings, Warren D'Azevedo, and my ever tolerant spouse, Don Fowler. And uh, Kelly thanked her mentors in addition. And I certainly thank Nicole and Susan, Susan for, Susie for putting this together, and as well as Reba. Uh, so I turn it now over to Laura. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, just so excited to be here. Um, so when Nicole and Susie contacted me about the symposium, you know, I was just delighted to even be uh, a part of that group, a part of something so positive. And at the time, though, I have to admit, I, I struggled a little bit about what, what kind of topic I wanted to talk about. And at the time, um, my friend Omar had passed away maybe about a year earlier. And so I wanted to take that opportunity to recognize her and, and the contributions that she made um, to the field of archaeology. So when they approached me again about putting together this publication, you know, I was, again, just thrilled to be a part of this. But I really appreciated the opportunity to kind of refine my thoughts. And what I realized was that my career has been marked by a number of different mentors, not, not just Omar. She definitely lit the fire, but um, along the way, along the path uh, for where I am now, there's definitely been a lot of other people that have contributed. Um, and those people, I, I'll mention them by name, um, Pamela Higgins, uh, when I, my time when I was with UDOT, um, Barbara Frank, who is another contributor to this volume, but unfortunately couldn't be here today. And then of course, Gardner Daly, um, who I got to know really well when I was working with the BLM. And I guess another part of, of my chapter that I really wanna emphasize is that we can all make contributions to our field um, in a lot of different ways. I remember when I was at field school um, with Barbara Frank, I remember her telling me that archeologists can be good at a lot of different things. You can be really good in the lab. You could be really good in the field. Um, it takes all different kinds of strengths um, to really move our discipline forward. So I will say that this has been difficult for me though, because um, you know, when it comes to my work, I have no problem going to toe to toe with somebody. You know, if, if somebody wants to challenge me on something I believe with my work, you know, bring it on. But something about this, this exercise just makes me feel very vulnerable because I feel like you know we're talking about our experiences and about our feelings and stuff. So um, despite that, I, I think it's really important for us to put our stories out there because that's how the next generation or, or other women might um, learn from our experiences or find comfort in or strength in, in our stories. Um, and so again, I'm just um, delighted to be a part of this, a part of something so positive for our field and for um, women in general. And aside from the mentors that I you know, wanted to thank, I'd also thank my family and friends. 
they've definitely helped me along the way. And just want to give a shout out to Susie and Nicole again for even putting us all together. Um, it's been a great experience and I really appreciate it. And with that, I'll turn it over to Shannon. Thanks, Laurel. Um, so I, um, I want to thank Suzanne, Nicole, and Reba, and all the co-authors for um, their collegiality and for um, making this happen. It's such an exciting uh, event to be part of, and um, I'm really pleased to be part of this. Um, our chapter, so I co-authored our chapter with Dr. Tiffany Fulkerson, who um, is on this call as well. Um, and our chapter was about the evolving gender and professional um, landscape of Great Basin archaeology. So um, we were really interested in basically um, providing a historical backdrop for a lot of the stories and narratives that you hear, um, the really rich stories that you hear from um, co-authors in this book. Um, and uh, we looked at um, a couple of different metrics to better understand historical dynamics in Great Basin archaeology. Um, we looked at national and regional publications, including um, publication metrics for the Journal of California and Great Basin Archaeology and American Antiquity. And then we really dove deep into data from um, the Great Basin Conference. And our research um, spanned um, 19, from 1954, from the beginnings of the Great Basin Conference, um, all the way to um, the present. And we, um, you know, we, we have been, um, Tiffany and I have been publishing on um, this kind of work um, for a few years now. Um, so it was really interesting to look at um, how things are working in the Great Basin. So the Great Basin has this sort of reputation for being a cowboy archaeology, cowgirl archaeology, however you want to put it. And um, I think that um, the the picture that we came up with historically um, was that the landscape of Great Basin archaeology has changed considerably. And this is not a surprise. I mean, in the beginnings of the Great, Great Basin Conference um, in 1954, this consisted of a small group of mostly men, not all men, there were some women, um, with Jess Jennings who sat down, um, mostly academics at the time, um, and they discussed culture history. Today, we see a vibrant um, gathering every other year of uh, professionals from um, academic, tribal, all sorts of different backgrounds, agency backgrounds, and the like. Um, so we see a lot of diversity when you go to the, um, the actual, um, these gatherings um, that are so important to many of us. Um, so we know that women are a, a major presence today, and we see almost 50% you know, parity today um, for participation among, in the Great Basin Conference. Um, but there are persistent inequities in um, publishing. So we still see um, a number of, um, we'd like to see more women publishing and um, more of their voices being, um, and ideas uh, being put to paper. And so um, to us, this is just an important part of um, improving um, not just equity, but diversity and science, which is really good. Uh, Multivocality is, you know, to get more ideas out there that can only improve science. Um, and that's something that we're seeing um, a lot of um, people working in the STEM sciences, they're discussing um, in uh, uh, multiple venues. Um, so, there, you know, we also discussed a, a few different, um, you know, possible uh, causes and, and ways that we can perhaps address these inequities um, and um, improve mentorship. This is a theme that um, Suzanne and uh, Nicole rightfully um, capture in their, in their introduction. And, and many of the stories that you hear about, you know, the success stories here, the women that are talking today um, will uh, mention uh, those personal connections that are so critical. Um, but I would say, um, you know, a take home message for us is that, um, you know, although uh, the Great Basin Conference, we see almost parity, there are improvements in um, publication records, more women are publishing, there, there are still problems, there are still and inequities. And although this is historical, um, we really have to think about the gains that we've made, particularly in the time of COVID um, or when, um, you know, it can be uh, 
very difficult for women to continue participating in, in, um, in publishing. Um, and then also, uh, how can we help uh, in, you know, scholars from diverse backgrounds, so people of color, um, LGBTQ um, community members, um, and uh, you know, take some of the, game, the, the things that we've learned as, as women and apply this to um, help other communities uh, and, and improve their voice, have, help, help them um, uh, participate in grave basin archaeology. Um, so with that, I will pass along to the next author, and I apologize, I can't remember who I'm supposed to pass the, the baton to right now, um, but thank you. I think that's me, Melinda. Thank you, Melinda. <laughs> sure. Thank you. And thank you so much, Reba, Nicole, and Susie, for, for this great opportunity to put uh, something together so wonderful and to be part of this much-needed work in archaeological literature. Um, as I mentioned in my paper, given at the Basin Conference, um, you know, we got a lot of feedback when we tried to, Karen Lupo and I tried to put together a volume and uh, ultimately were told, and this was years ago, that it had already been done and didn't need to be done again. Um, thank you. Um, I wanted to talk about the fact that the emerging notion of landscape in archeology span was a really meaningful concept in geography and archeology span and was pivotal for me in writing um, a chapter for this volume. Um, landscape, as we're thinking about it now in archeology, span really entails much more than just trees and plants and ground and rocks. Uh, it is cultural, it is temporal, it is symbolic, and these landscapes of the past are vitally important for us to understand as we look deep into the contextual past. Um, the work here in our volume was deeply personal for me too, allowing me to see my own relationship to the study of the past and really how it has rooted my whole identity, my entire life almost. Um, as mentioned earlier, I'm in, a, in an important uh, moment of transition myself where I've recently retired and this has triggered all kinds of questions for me and maybe a few of you could relate to this. Who am I now? Um, I'm no longer a teacher, uh, sort of a part-time researcher, but uh, not really. And so am I still an archeologist? And the answer that I feel deeply in myself is that, that it's an important point of transition. And I still wanna be mindful of my, my new identity as a retired person. But uh, even though I'm now more of an observer than um, of the past and my own personal connection to that past, I'm less of an analyst. Um, and, and I think that can come to suit me just fine. <clears throat> I've come back full circle in this transition to the contact, my earliest contact with archaeology, which, um, in, which I've sort of pursued in coming back to the Southwest. I, I've now just retired to Southeast New Mexico near my birthplace of El Paso, to the desert that moved me as a child uh, initially to become an archeologist. And it really does give me great joy to reconnect with this landscape. I feel profoundly in touch with the past here as I rediscover this wonderful place. And so I think I am still an archeologist, <laughs> even if my role in that field is gonna change dramatically. Um, I wrote a lot in my chapter about the emerging uh, landscape of theory in our field. I feel like it's been transformative for all of us as we've moved deeper and deeper into our professional lives. Um, and I've also witnessed the evolution of my own perspectives about studying the past. Um, I'm trying to come to the fact that we don't own the past, we're not, you know, the glorious pursuers of truth about the past. We are accountable for what we do, uh, and we have a very limited understanding of what happened in the past that, that's shaped entirely by our own perspectives and upbringings. Um, excavation damages a fragile record. Uh, archaeology assaults sacred places from some people's perspectives. And what and whose stories are we really telling? I think we're mostly just telling our own story about exploring the past and what it means to be connected through archeological community to, to an experience that we have. But I'm not sure I can speak to any truth about the past except to what I myself uh, 
experience. In many ways, I think we, we have to reckon for our behavior and the ways in which we've represented the past and the ancestors of, of that past. Um, we are just observers. So what is our role moving forward? I think as many have noted in, in the volume, um, we as archeologists certainly need to explore the past with empathy and with greater connection uh, to the landscape and to those who descend from the people who, who emerged there and the people that we have studied. Um, I think this means giving up some power on our part and becoming more humble and I'm quite comfortable with this. Um, I love our new awareness that symbol and meaning are embedded in every social action and in every material aspect of the landscape and that we are certainly barely scratching the surface of what there is to know and understand and that too is okay with me. Um, and we can along the way embrace and celebrate our deep and personal connections to the past even while we seek to be better uh, scientists and, and humanists always uh, never quite reaching a pinnacle, but I think we're, we're, we're more open to understanding our role in that the discovery of the past. So thank you so much, uh, Reba and Nicole and Susie for this opportunity. This is, this is a wonderful volume that I'm very privileged to be part of. So I'll pass this on to Linda now. Forgot to unmute, thank you, Melinda. Ah, I really feel that my journey has been affected by serendipity and taking risks to follow my interests. I've discovered along the way that my interest in lab work and research was far greater than that in actually digging in the field. And that caused me to wonder how can I integrate that interest? Um, because the field of archaeobotany didn't really exist or wasn't acknowledged when I was feeling my way there. Certainly people were examining and identifying seeds, but it didn't really extend beyond that into the microscopic world. Um, so to me, it felt very risky to follow my interests. And I did that by keeping my job as a secretary, which of course was the label so many men placed upon me, that was the job that I could get once I got my degree. So yeah, degree in anthropology, a bachelor's qualifies you to do what? Well, lots of things, but certainly at that time, not anthropology or archeology, span because I was um, also, like many of you, considered not hireable. Um, but by finding this niche, I felt like I could move forward. And so I pursued that for the first three years in my spare time, shall we say, evenings and weekends. And the more I used a microscope to take a look at what the archeologists were dig up, digging up, the more hooked I became. I, I really feel that a microscope um, is my trowel. That's my tool of discovery. So, Yes, I did love landscapes. And so by looking at the pollen record, I could see these landscapes unfold before my eyes. It's like watching a movie as I counted the pollen samples because I could, I could see the landscape, the pine trees, the juniper trees, the sagebrush in the Southwest. And um, it just became more and more engaging. I combined that with my curiosity and enjoyment of food. Um, of course, both eating, but also cooking food. And once I learned that the microbotanic record held clues to, fo to food, food processing, food preparation of food consumption, oh man, that was, that was all I needed. That really opened the door for me. Um, so I really felt like I was getting that glimpse into the past. I could I could tell you about where the people lived, what their landscape looked like. I could tell you about what they cooked, what they ate, what they collected, what they gathered. And that was how I started building the stories, both in my head and in the reports. I created a small business because um, this vision that I had was not embraced. 
by the largely male faculty at any university that I talked to. And I thought, okay, why not? I can do this. And, um, and I can do it one step at a time. So I bought a microscope. I made reference slides. One tiny thing at a time, I um, put my woodworking and uh, skills to work and built my own laboratory. Um, so there were, there were just so many things uh, where I was exploring along the way. And as I created this small business and began to have success, it became a, oh no, no, don't throw me in the briar patch type of a journey. So, um, and that also, that also hooked me into what I was doing. Um, it was that feeling of making lemonade from lemons. How could I achieve what I knew was possible and really show the people out there, um, look, it can be done. And, um, and you'll be fascinated once you, once you read about it. I go back to what I was told about writing my master's thesis, which uh, my major professor said, I'll read the introduction and I'll read the conclusions. He said, if you don't have anything interesting to say, I'm certainly not reading the middle. That taught me a lot. It taught me to engage people. And um, so it might sound like kind of a snippy comment, but I really grew from that. Um, I've also really enjoyed working with archeologists, not only throughout the US, but around the world, because with each new, with each new archeologist who's willing to engage and talk about their project, I learned something. I learned something of their perspective. I learned about what they saw when they excavated in the ground. And I learned about the questions they were asking and the questions they wanted me to solve. And, um, that obviously became part of my journey. And so solving those questions became my primary focus. And as I grew and learned more, it became, aha, uh -huh, you asked me this question, here's your answer to that question, and that opened the door to these five other questions. And I'll describe that to you. And, um, and that's really what's kept me engaged all these years. Um, it doesn't feel like doing the same thing over and over. feels like every time I open a box of samples, it's like, oh, goody, this is Christmas. What's in this one? Um, so I really want to thank all of the archaeologists that I've had the opportunity to work with in the past for how they have sometimes changed and often augmented my view of the past through their eyes and them asking me the questions that they wanted answers to. So I think I'll always be curious. I'll always be that observer. Um, I'll always relate our present to the past and our past to the present and the future. Um, I'd really like to encourage women to follow their passions about careers, to blaze new trails when you see no obvious path forward in front of you. Um, you have the power to make it happen. Also, um, I really would like to thank um, my mentors and my, especially my family and my friends who've helped along the way. So I'd like to turn this back to Hannah, I believe. Uh, yes. Thank you. We got um, several questions. Uh, if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat, but these were ones that were submitted beforehand. Uh, let me get to the first one. Um, what was the most challenging part of distilling your personal experience in archaeology into one book chapter? I'll answer that one. Not getting caught in the weeds not trying to tell the details of every single event, distilling things down to a bigger picture. I 
want to say I um, I really wish joined us here today. She is another contributor to the book. And I don't mean to speak for her because I don't know what her process was, but her chapter was one of the most vulnerable um, and um, really challenging chapters to read in the book. And I think I I just want to say for everybody that wrote chapters that are very personal, um, as a woman reading those chapters, I appreciate so much that you were willing to share that about yourself. And I really appreciate the vulnerability in these chapters and sharing these very deeply personal stories. It must have taken an, Im an immense amount of courage. So thanks to, <laughs> to you all for having done that. Right. I'm, I'm going to combine two questions together. Um, so the first part of the question is, what kind of biases do Caucasian males, uh, Caucasian male archaeologists usually have? And how do we convince our male allies that they are allowed to be in the conversation with us? I can try and answer that. I think um, I think there is implicit bias, whether um, people know they have it or not. Um, they often are just, I mean, we all do this, right? We see things from our own perspective and within our own framework. And so we often don't even know that we are making decisions based on only what we can see and we don't recognize that maybe we're not uh, offering a hand to somebody else that might need a little support or is fully capable of doing the job just as they are um, i think that happens a lot and it's up to us to kind of keep us as as women and allies to keep speaking up when we see these kinds of things happening um, it's not always easy it's actually never easy, <laughs> but um, you know, not just us as women, but also our allies to say, "Hey, that doesn't seem something's not quite right here. Let's let's make this right." Yeah, Susie, I would add to. Um, I don't know if I would necessarily narrow it down to like white Caucasian males. It seems like there's some systematic discrimination. I thought. Um, what Heidi said about how you can't always recognize it. It's not always in your face. Um, it, sometimes it's very subtle and it's even hard to articulate exactly what the discrimination is or what it feels like. And um, I think as far as, you know, women are just looking for equal footing, if anything. Um, one of my, my, my best mentors and good, good friend, you know, Gardner, he, he treats me like an equal. He, he appreciates my, my opinion and stuff. And so I think, um, you know, women are just looking to be able to engage in those conversations with, with men and have, you know, the same respect and the opportunities and stuff. So. You know, one thing that I found was interesting uh, when I started my own archaeological consulting company, I recognized pretty early on that I was choosing certain clients and the majority we're women. It, it um, kind of opened my eyes to thinking about uh, who, who I wanted to be and what I wanted my company to be. For example, I avoided industries like oil because there's so much, how can I say it nicely, testosterone, pushy deadlines, ignoring my family requirements. So, um, they're not just biases on the part of men that they may not recognize, but women also are biased in the way they select their path. Thank you. Um, so uh, in the earlier on in the um, in early days of women in archaeology, what were some of the major arguments against women? 
entering archaeology. One that I one that I encountered was, well, you're a woman and now you're married. You're just going to go home, have babies, and that's the end of it. We won't see you anymore. You are not worth us investing in you. And I mean, that along with the, you're a woman, you can't dig as fast, you don't have the upper body strength, you can't wield the um, heavy wheelbarrows, yada, 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 move the rocks, et cetera. But the biggest one for me was, oh no, you're not gonna stay in the field, you're not gonna be a professional. So that was the hard one. I can certainly echo that. Um, it's, it's, it's a, Nancy Parizo has done a great deal with this and other themes against women uh, in Southwest archeology span and also other areas, but particularly the Southwest with her Daughters of the Desert compilation and uh, the conference that Wintergren held surrounding it. And um, the marriage issue was always there for the early women. Uh, you mentors won't take you on because you're going to leave and get married and that, that'll be the end of it. And some women like Heidi, for example, did both. It was assumed that you could multitask like men can supposedly, but uh, so we, we get labeled as because of that and also many other uh, problems. Uh, when Kelly went on the field school with Kidder, um, he, he couldn't really discriminate against women because um, the, it, it was an NSF project, or not, well, it wasn't NSF, sorry, it was Museum of New Mexico project. But Elsie Clues Parsons, who was another very dynamic woman, already had him on the carpet for not having any women in his field schools or in anything else. So he didn't dare breach her uh, or get tangled with her because she was very ruthless um, in a kind way, but ruthless nonetheless. And so when Krober wrote a letter of recommendation for Kelly to go on the field school, he said, of course, I'm hoping for an all, all male applicants this year. And Kidder wrote back that he uh, he basically would not uh, uh, discriminate against women and would have a separate group of women if, if enough good women replied. Well, it turned out that four very good women applied. One was not able to continue, but Kelly was one of them. And so that kind of thing goes way, way back in the discipline and certainly the job opportunities that I mentioned as well. Uh, women don't need these jobs. They're, they're basically going to be taken care of by some male. Well, that didn't always happen. As we well know, it didn't happen for Kelly, didn't happen for a lot of women. So they're not, they were not given an equal chance there either. Hey, I think you also mentioned in your chapter of, um, issues of safety and women working alone in the field and that that yeah. was another um, roadblock for a lot of women. Yeah, it definitely was. Um, I think a lot of, of the fear of the Glen Canyon project was not uh, that it was too dangerous, but that mixing a crew would be very dangerous. and. Uh, uh, I don't know why uh, he or others thought that we couldn't defend ourselves if we wanted to, but that was the that was the underlying premise at the time that we'd be out there vulnerable. One thing that I thought was interesting about uh, the fact that women were excluded from archaeological field schools, but uh, they were allowed to go in the field as ethnographers and work with strange cultures, strange cultures in really dangerous situations. So there's kind of a disconnect between 
we don't want them. We don't want women with us because we can't, uh, we can't stop ourselves from getting into trouble versus it's okay for women to go out in these situations with strangers. What do you think about that, Kay? <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> And of course, there was an incident in the 1930s of a woman ethnographer being killed uh, in, in Apache country, a uh, student. But it was her own fault. She didn't know the rules of the culture well enough, and it led to disaster. But uh, when you think of other notables like Margaret Mead and others who went off to the field by themselves um, with very little preparation, uh, they did just fine. So. Also, I might add with reference to the Dutton, uh, to Bertha Dutton and her um, adventures, so to speak, um, that she ran a dig for six years in the Southwest with all Girl Scout crew. And uh, Fred Wendorf came one time and he looked at the excavation and he said, I've never seen a bunch of boys work that hard. So. It was not a matter of them being able to wield shovels and pickaxes and throw rock debris off the walls of a large Pueblo, but uh, their dedication, basically, and their ability to, to tough it. Great. I think we have time for one last question. Um, I think this question is directed towards uh, Suzanne and Nicole. What is one possible outcome you'd like to see as a result of the publication of your work? Um, that question's for my mom, so I can <laughs> try and start to answer it, and then Nicole can chime in. But I think for me, I, I really want this to kind of open the door to more women telling their stories. Um, I don't want this to just be a one-time flash in the pan. I know that, um, like Melinda said, she tried to get a project like this off the ground many, many years ago, and it, it didn't really fly. Uh, I just want this to be, you know, especially now during the Me Too movement, I want it to be a part of um, that, where we feel supported by one another, by our allies, uh, and that we're not just like working in a silo alone so i just I, and that's partly why we created the book right to keep the momentum of the conference symposium going and so i'd like to just kind of see it used um in college i want i just want everybody to know about this and everybody's stories and what we can do to make things better going forward Yeah, thanks, Susie. I think, of course, all of that. And also, um, one of our goals was that we really wanted to have um, people working in all different aspects of archaeology represented in this book so that any aspirational archaeologist might be able to read it and see that there are so many paths um, to go down. We thought that was really important. And we wanted to highlight the successes of women in all of these different aspects of archaeology so that um, people can see what a diverse and interesting and exciting field it is to be in. Um, and then we also wanted um, people to be able to read these stories and see themselves in the story and see that um, even though there might be obstacles for us to overcome, um, look at how successful the people on this panel are. I mean, what an incredible, incredible group of women. And so to see that, um, you know, uh, to see how those experiences um, shape our ultimate trajectories, career and personal trajectories, and to see yourselves reflected in those stories and to know that there's um, a lot of support out there. We have so many allies, we have so many wonderful mentors, and um, to feel uplifted by these, um, the stories in the book is really important for us. And I really hope that that is um, 
you know, what is a takeaway for uh, any aspiring archaeologist or anybody in the field who is maybe unsure about where they're headed or wh what's to come. So I think that's a big, um, that's what we really hope people take away from it. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, Reba, I'll pass it over to you. Hi, everyone. I want to just thank everybody uh, for coming today. We really do appreciate your time. Um, I also want to acknowledge that the director of the University Press is with us today. Her name is Glenda Cotter. And I want to thank her very much for supporting this kind of work. Uh, I think it's very important, as does she. And we're very glad to be to have been publishing this book. Uh, we're really excited to bring it out now, and we can't wait to have everybody have a chance to read it and take a look and be inspired. So thank you all so much again for coming, and uh, we'll leave it there. And if you have any more questions or comments, uh, feel free to get a hold of us. Um, my email and Hannah's email is on the press website, and we're happy to address questions. Thank you again, and. Uh, we hope you have a great day. Happy Veterans Day. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.